Good morning. Today, Pastor Peter Chin will share the message from John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. I will read in English, and Caleb will read in Spanish. Hear the word of the Lord. Cuando terminaron de desayunar, Jesús le preguntó a Simón Pedro, Simón, hijo de Juan, ¿me amas más que estos? Sí, Señor, tú sabes que te quiero, contestó Pedro. Apacienta mis corderos, le dijo Jesús. Y volvió a preguntarle, Simón, hijo de Juan, ¿me amas? Sí, Señor, tú sabes que te quiero. Cuida de mis ovejas. Por tercera vez Jesús le preguntó, Simón, hijo de Juan, ¿me quieres? A Pedro le dolió que por tercera vez Jesús le hubiera preguntado, ¿me quieres? Así que le dijo, Señor, tú lo sabes todo, tú que te sabes que te quiero, apacienta mis ovejas, le dijo Jesús. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. De veras te aseguro que cuando eras más joven, te vestías tú mismo e ibas a donde querías. Pero cuando seas viejo, extenderás las manos y otro te vestirá y te llevará a donde no quieres ir. Esto dijo Jesús para dar a entender la clase de muerte con que Pedro glorificaría a Dios. Después de eso añadió, sígueme. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This, this is the, the word, word of the Lord. Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, we took a couple of weeks off to think about and talk about worry and anxiety. And from what I've heard, it is a, a very constant theme. All of us are going through worry and anxiety um, just based off the feedback that I was getting. But really, the sermon series that we're in right now is we're talking about distinctive features of our church, some rack distinctives. And we're not just talking about things that every church does, like, oh, we read the Bible and we worship and we love Jesus. We're really highlighting some things that are unique to us as a church. And so I wanted to rewind a bit and to talk about some of the distinctives that we've, we've covered so far. We started off by talking about diversity, that we are a very diverse church. But we went a bit further to say that this diversity is not just a, a good thing, it's a God thing. That when we get to the kingdom of heaven, it's going to be diverse. This is a reflection of God's heart for all time. And because it's so important, we need to work for it. It's not just something that we appreciate and we say, oh, I go to a diverse church. We actually have to invest and run alongside of this gift that God has given us. We also talked about being connected to our history, that we were founded in 1904. So we are a historical church, but not just that we were founded in 1904, but we actually look back to the previous generations for guidance, for a sense of who we have been, to chart a course in terms of who we will be. And so we talk about our elders. We talk about the generations that come before because that is important for us. We also talked about justice and spirituality, how in many churches the conversation about justice feels separate from spirituality that we have these spiritual practices of praying and worshiping, but justice is like an extracurricular that we may or may not do. And the way that we look at justice spirituality is that they are two sides of one coin. They're different parts of one tree. That if you're really faithful to Scripture and you're faithful to what the Bible says, it will lead us to think about the good of the people around us. It cannot help but do so. That if we're reading scripture in a way where we don't care about the people around us, we are not reading scripture correctly. I guarantee you that. And so spirituality will always lead us to justice. 
But opposite, if we want to truly pursue justice in a way that is faithful, in a way that is sustainable, we have to be filled by God's spirit. It's a spiritual exercise at the same time. Next week, we're going to talk about our Wesleyan heritage. We are Methodists, meaning that we honor John Wesley and B.T. Roberts. And because of that, Reverend Allison Coventry will be coming to share a little bit about that heritage and why that kind of positions us for ministry, not just in the past, but in the future as well. So we're looking forward to hearing from Pastor uh, Allison as well. In order to introduce the distinctive feature that I'll be talking about today, I wanted to rewind the clock a bit and to go back to the very start of my ministry here. It is July of 2022, which marks the eighth year anniversary that I have been the lead pastor here, because I started in July of 2014. And so I wanted to show a picture of uh, the very first Sunday that I was here. The very first Sunday I was here eight years ago. And if you look very closely, there are only six people in my family, because Xavier was still in Carol's belly at that time. So that's why Carol looks like she's holding two people, because she literally was. Um, so that was the very first Sunday that we came here to this service. And I think that's Jonathan, who is uh, clearly excited about the service and overwhelmed with emotion because of, <laughs> because of that time. Uh, but that was eight years ago. And uh, Xavier was born very shortly thereafter. And so I took paternity leave kind of before and afterwards. And my first sermons really were in the fall of 2014. That's when I began my, my preaching ministry, which was really closer to September. And one of the very first sermons that I preached was from the book of Joshua, talking about transitions, actually, which seems very appropriate to the season that we're in. But I very directly started talking about the concept of harem. And harem is a word that's used in the book of Joshua when talking about the city of Jericho, when God commands the people of Israel to destroy every living thing that exists in that city. And we talked about that very directly. Talked about what does that mean that God would order the destruction of an entire city? And as I talked about that, jaws dropped <laughs> across the congregation. Just I saw people kind of do this weird thing where they kind of recoil a little bit. And it felt very uncomfortable, I could tell, for a lot of people to talk about this. Because usually when we talk about Jericho, we talk about the walls falling down. And then we skip to other things like the 12 stones and other stuff. And in that moment, to see people just, whoa, we're going to talk about this instead, um, I could realize people were very shocked by that. But I think in some way, that moment captures a distinctive feature that we have carried forth from that time, and that is this. At RAC, rather than avoiding hard conversations about heart issues, we try to address them head on. And I think those of you who have been here any length of time, you know that that's true. We tend not to dance around things, but instead we address it pretty directly. Even last week, we talked about Roe v. Wade, the same week that that decision came out, so that we're addressing those issues. And that is something that we have done frequently throughout our time. If you're new to our church and you haven't seen kind of the whole arc of this, when things happen that are important and we feel are affecting us and we want to know how our faith informs those conversations and those, those situations, we tend to do that. We've talked about sexual violence. And we've done uh, uh, sermons on Tamar and Judah and, and things like that. We've talked about mass shootings. If you have been here, you know when there are mass shootings, we do laments for them because we refuse to normalize to them. We refuse as a congregation to say, this is okay for mass shootings to happen in our country. We've addressed racism, whether it's anti-black racism, anti-Asian racism, over and over again. We've talked about refugees and immigration. We've talked about political division, especially during the presidential elections. We've addressed mental health and have had counselors and social workers from our congregation come up and share about the importance of mental health. We've talked about gentrification which is taking place at a rapid rate in this community where we are right now. And so we've addressed all of these things. Instead of just avoiding it or putting it to the side, we've addressed it in our Sunday sermons, in our small groups, in our conferences, in our book studies, kind of throughout the different parts in the life of our church. And this actually predated me as well. Because I know some of the moments that the church did before 2014, there was the mass shooting at SPU that some of us were at SPU during that time. And there was a time of lament in this church for that mass shooting. 
When Trayvon Martin died, there was a time of lament for Trayvon Martin's death as well. And so this is a pattern, this is a practice that predates me that I think truly is a distinctive feature of our church. And if you're new to our church, it's something you should get ready for, that we will have these hard decisions, we will address these hard truths. Because this is something that I think is a consistent feature of our church, but it's also very difficult, I think it's good for us to get some guidance, for us to have some way of understanding this, for us to understand why would we do this and how should we do this. And the way that we're going to explore this is through John 21. That John 21 provides guidance not just as to why we should address heart issues, but also how we should do so. So that we know it's not just a practice that we have adopted for ourselves, but it has a basis in Scripture and it has a basis in Jesus' ministry as well. So John 21 21 provides us with four kind of um, guidelines for us as to how we should be uh, pursuing this practice as a church. And the first thing that we get from John 21 is that we should address hard issues consistently. Consistently. I think maybe some of the impact of John 21 and the passage that we read is lost on us. How hard of a moment this really is for Peter. And in order to understand why this is so difficult for Peter, we have to rewind the clock to Good Friday. Because leading up to Good Friday, Peter swears on his life that he would never disown and never deny Jesus ever. He would rather die than that ever happened. And yet, lo and behold, leading him to Good Friday when a slave girl asked Peter, hey, do you know Jesus? He's so afraid of the consequences that he says, I don't know, I don't even know who you're talking about. I've never, I'm new to this place. I've never heard of this man. And he does that not just once, but three times. And it tells us on the third time, he swears an oath. He swears to God saying, may someone be cursed. May I be cursed if I'm not telling the truth. So three times he denies Jesus. But of course, Jesus rises from the dead and speaks with Peter. And I'm sure Peter is hoping that Jesus will not bring this up. He'll just kind of let it go. But lo and behold, what do we find Jesus saying? But do you love me? Not just once, but three times. And the third time it hits Peter, this is not an accident. This is not a random question. He's asking this question specifically because Peter denied Jesus three times. And it tells us that Peter's crushed by this. He's crushed by the realization that Jesus is bringing this up and bringing it before him. You denied me three times, and I'm going to ask you this question three times. A very difficult moment that we'll unpack as we go along. But what I think is interesting about this moment is that it's not isolated. It's not as if it comes out of nowhere. There's this random conversation that Jesus has with Peter because he's been doing this all throughout his ministry. This is consistent with how Jesus acts and what Jesus says. For example, in Matthew 23, when he's speaking to the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, he says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You have practiced the latter without, you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. So this is not the first time that he has these hard conversations. He'll even do it to Peter when he says this. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So from this, we get a sense of how Jesus addresses these things. That while difficult, Jesus' conversation with Peter in John 21 was not surprising because it was consistent with what he had done throughout his ministry. This is not out of the blue. It's not just a once, every so often thing that he would do. He's consistent in calling out these truths and confronting them head on. And that is the model for us, that we want to confront these things in a consistent manner. And I think that is really the drawback in many churches, that churches will address things, but they'll do so just like once a year. Maybe when it's Black History Month or when something happens, they'll kind of address it in a very sporadic way. What we try to do is to be consistent with this. So it's a consistent conversation that you know that you're going to have conversations like this on a pretty, pretty, pretty regular basis. And the reason that we want to do that is that by addressing issues consistently, 
It reflects a deeper commitment to those issues, but also is more effective in transforming our attitudes to them. The more that we bring up something, the more that it reflects that we really care about it. Can we really say that we care about an issue, but we don't talk about it? Is that really a good reflection of how, how much that we care about those things? I don't think so. It's by addressing things consistently that we're communicating that these things really are important to us. But the other part of the reason that we try to talk about these things consistently is that it's more effective. How much can we transform or change or learn a new, sc new skill if you only do it once a year? How much better will you get at basketball if you play basketball once a year? Or knitting if you knit once a year? It's really difficult to really grow in any kind of practice, any kind of discipline or skill if you only do it every so often. And so it is with addressing issues, that the more consistently that we do this, the better we are at it and the more transformation we see in our lives. And so that's the first way in which we try to address these issues. We try to do it consistently in the same way that Jesus did. The second thing that we see from John 21 is that we should address heart issues within the context of relationship. Within the context of relationship. In John 21, in the passage that we read, we see Jesus having this very hard conversation with Peter. What we don't get from this one passage is that the entire chapter of John 21 is actually about relationships. Every other kind of moment in this passage is a reminder of the relationship that Peter shares with Jesus. He's not just going to call out Peter. He's also going to remind Peter of all the moments and all the times that they have shared together. For example, in verse 6 of this same chapter, Jesus said to them, throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some fish. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. And if you know the Gospels, you know this is not an isolated moment. What does this remind us of? It reminds us of the calling of Peter. Not just this moment, but way back in time, years before, when Jesus called Peter that very first time. And then in verse 13, it tells us this. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. And what is this a reminder of? It's a reminder of the meals that they've shared together. It's a reminder of the Last Supper where he broke the bread and gave it to them. In verse 19, Jesus says to Peter, come, follow me. And it's not just about this moment. It's a reminder of that first calling where he calls this uneducated fisherman to follow after Jesus. And so we remember from this is that he's not just calling out Peter saying, hey, you denied me three times. He's reminding Peter of all the relationship that they share, all the memories, all the times, all the journeys that they've had together. That's what John 21 really is. This moment of calling out is embedded in relationship. It's embedded in love. It's embedded in the memories that they have together. And that is also a guidepost for us as we address issues, that we don't want to just address issues in isolation and say, we're going to talk about this issue and talk about that issue. We want to embed it in the context of relationships and the people that are around us. And the reason we do that is this, that by connecting issues to our relationships, we humanize those issues and deepen our motivation to address them. We could just talk about racism and address the issue of racism, but when we talk about the racism that the person next to you is experiencing, then we realize it's not just an idea, it's a reality. It's a reality that people around us are suffering from. And when we recognize that our friends or our small group members or the human beings that are next to us are suffering these kinds of things, we don't just humanize that issue, but we have a much deeper motivation to try to stamp it out and to try to stop that from being true. That's why we try to bring people into the midst of these issues because they're not just issues and they are human beings and we are far more vote motivated to try to address them. And that's what we have tried to consistently do whenever we talk about issues. We don't talk about issues just in isolation at the church, but we try to help us remember that there are people who are at the heart of those issues. For example, we've talked about refugees, and there was a time where the presidential administration was slashing the number of refugees based off the idea, these people are dangerous. They come from unstable nations. And so we don't know what kind of instability they're going to bring into our country. And so we had friends from our church that we know come and share their story. 
So that we're not talking about refugees. We're saying, oh, you're talking about Sahai. And you're talking about Rangkam. And you're talking about Khoi. You're talking about Seng. You're talking about Thai. Is that who you're talking about? These dangerous elements who might destabilize a country? You're talking about Um? You're talking about those folks. And then we realize, wait, wait, that's not true. That's not right. There's a very different dimension to this conversation. When we were talking about racism and we were talking about microaggressions, we didn't just talk about the concepts and, and all this different kind of ideological academic things. We had people from our congregation tell us about how they have to code switch, how they have to kind of put their identity aside in order to fit in. And we heard from Pastor Mark and Karina Saunders and from Leonetta and so many different people so that we might know this is not just an academic question. There are people in our church who have to do this. We talked about sexual assault, not as a topic, but Boo came up here and gave a powerful testimony of surviving sexual abuse and being coming through that to the point where she and Ada started a sexual abuse support group that other women might, might have a new breath, a new sense of where they might go. A few years ago in Spokane, there was a youth group that had a terrible experience of racism that they experienced that they were traveling to a youth conference. And we thought to ourselves, we could just pray for them or we could be there for them. And so we bought a care package full of gummy treats. Uh, I think there might have been junior mints in there, but also a Nintendo Switch. We put a Nintendo Switch in that care package and Pastor Mark and Jeremy and Albie drove it out there, hung out with them for the entire day that they might not, they might know that it's not just academic. Oh, people are praying for us. There are literally people who are visiting you and telling you that we love you and we're on your side. That's how we want to address these issues, not as academic topics and, and conversations, but instead humanizing them and recognizing there are people at the heart of these things. And so that's another way in which we address these issues. Another piece of guidance we get from John 21 is that we should address hard issues for the purpose of restoration, the purpose of restoration. When you do something wrong and the person you wronged comes up to you, what do you want them to do? What is your hope and your prayer when you see them again at a party or at a family reunion or coming down the street and you see this person whom you wronged quite badly? If you're anything like me, the one thing that I say, well, these first you say is, hey, in that kind of very ambivalent kind of way. And the second thing you think to yourself is, please don't bring it up. Please don't bring up that, that hard moment. Please, let's not talk about this. It'd be the kindest thing you could do, the most mature, the most humane thing you could do is just not bring that up. And I guarantee, it doesn't tell us this, but I just want to go on a limb and I can almost guarantee Peter was thinking the same thing. That he sees Jesus and he remembers, oh my gosh, I disowned him three times. What is he going to say? What is he going to say in this moment? And I'm sure his prayer in that moment was, please, just don't bring this up. Don't bring it up. Just let it go. Be mature about this. And doesn't that feel like that's a mature thing? If we're on the opposite side of that conversation, we're like, I'll just be big about it and I won't bring it up. And Peter's praying that as he meets with Jesus. And lo and behold, he gets this question. Peter, do you love me? And right there, he should have known what was going on. That's not a regular question that you get asked. But he says, oh, yeah, I love you. And then a second time, Peter, do you love me? And he says, yes, you know, you know that I love you. And then finally, a third time, Peter, do you love me? And then it dawns. He knows that he's, it's not a random question. He's bringing it up. He's bringing up this major failure that Peter committed on Good Friday. And we ask, why? Why would you do this? The kind thing, the compassionate thing in that moment would just to be say, ah, Peter, I love you. Let's just move on water under the bridge. That would have been the kind thing to do. Why would Jesus do this? What could possibly be his motivation in bringing up this hard moment? Well, in order to understand this, it's actually helpful to look at the heading that comes before this passage. In the NIV, they have these subheadings that come before the passages. And they're not in there in the Greek, but they're in there from biblical scholars who try to help us know what's going on. Sometimes those headings are actually bad and misleading. For example, many years, the heading before the parable of the lost son was the parable of the prodigal son. The word prodigal is actually never used in that passage. The word lost is. And so we were programmed over and over to think, oh, this son is a prodigal son. 
And so that's an interesting way in which sometimes we get misled by these headings. In this moment, though, it's actually really helpful. I don't know if you can see it. It's also extremely bright because I could see everyone light up in the, in the church when this, when this slide came on. But the heading says this, Jesus reinstates Peter. Jesus reinstates Peter. Why is he doing this? Why is he bringing it up? Is he bringing it up to crush Peter? To call him out to say, hey, Peter, I saw you. I remember. And the three times that you denied me, I'm going to bring this up three times. Is that why he's doing this? No. The reason he's doing this is to restore Peter. He says this three times so Peter can be forgiven three times. For every single moment that he denied Jesus, that he can take it away. He can restore him. That's why he's doing this. That's the purpose of this hard moment, of this hard truth, is to restore him fully. And that should be the goal for us as well. The goal of addressing hard issues should never be to call out and condemn, but to reinstate and restore. That's why we do it. That's why we do this. That's why Jesus does it. Even with the Pharisees, we think, oh, he hates the Pharisees. He just yells at them, that whole woe to you Pharisee things. He does that because he's their, he's their enemy and he wants to put them down. But no, he loves Nicodemus. He loves these Pharisees. We think about the city of Jerusalem, the same city that would crucify him at Good Friday. When he enters into the city of Jerusalem on the, the week of Holy Week, the first prayer that he utters is, Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, how I've longed to embrace you. How I've longed to, to gather you up like a mother hen gathers chicks. He loves this city. He loves the people who are going to crucify him. This is the goal of these hard truths. is not to condemn and destroy, but to reinstate and to restore. And the reason why that is so important for every single one of us to hear is because that is not the spirit of this age. Calling out and condemning, calling people out on what they have done wrong. I mean, you can go anywhere and find that. That's, that's what we do. That's what everyone should be doing. And actually, strangely enough, there is a precedent for that in the Christian life, for accountability and calling people out in the same way. But the reason we do it is so important. As Christians, we might do that, but we do that because we love a person, because we want to restore them. We want to reinstate them, not to crush them into the ground. And that is so important for us to keep in mind as we do this practice. The final thing that we can take away from John 21 is this. We address hard truths, not just so that we can face our past, but so we can prepare us, so to prepare us for the future. This is a wonderful moment of per personal reconciliation between Peter and Jesus, right? They had this falling out. He says, I don't even know my best friend. But here, Jesus restores him and says, come and follow me. This technically could have been the end of Peter's story. This could, I mean, we don't hear much about the other disciples by name. And so this could be the last mentioning that we hear of Peter. And it would have been a good ending. It would have been, so, you know, we would say, oh, they weren't fighting. They, they were reconciled to one another. And we could have rejoiced simply in that fact. But we all know this is not the end of Peter's ministry. This is the only beginning. This is the midpoint because after the reinstatement, Peter's ministry really takes off. That's when he becomes the apostle he is going to be. And it happened days after the reinstatement. In Acts chapter 1, in those days, meaning days after the reinstatement, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago. This is before the Pentecost. Then later when we tackle something, it's that much smaller and that much lower. Right? There has been growth through every single moment. Yes, it was painful. Guaranteed, it was painful for all of us. That pain was like a marathon runner's pain. It results in something and it changes us that the next time it gets that much easier for us to run that course. I saw this dramatically when I had a speaking engagement a couple of months ago where I spoke with a very evangelical congregation, meaning quite conservative in many ways. And I brought up a, not a very controversial point. I said, 25% of the world's population does not have access to clean water. They cannot access clean water, that most basic of things, right? What problem does anyone have with clean water? But even in that moment, I could see a bracing. I could see it checking out because there was this question, wait, is this the, the slippery slope 
Now we're going to talk about, what do we talk about now? We're talking about this issue or that issue, this kind of fear of this moment, just by talking about water. And when I think about us and our congregation, I think we've come so far. And I don't mean to be uh, arrogant about it or, or, or paternal about it, but I am proud of us. I'm proud of our congregation. I'm proud of you for sticking through these moments. And I want you to see yourselves and see that you are more buff than you thought you were. And you can run further than you thought you could. And you are more able to have these conversations than you once were. And it's hard to see because there's no muscles. You can't see the growth and you can't look in the mirror and say, wow, look at me. But I can see you. And I can see how far we've come. And I want us to know in closing is this. There are hard issues we have to face in the future, but we are better prepared for those conversations than we have ever been before. There are some hard things we have to talk about, about gender, sexuality, abortion. These are imminent conversations, and man, it feels intimidating for me, and I know it does for you as well. But I want you to see yourselves correctly. I don't want you to see yourselves as swimmers or as people being thrown off to the Pacific Ocean to the the deepest of the deep ends. I want you to see yourselves as swimmers. We've been training for this. We've been swimming. We have been walking. We have been running. We have been doing this over and over, and it counted for something. Every time we did, we all got a little stronger, and we all got a little more able to do this. And so as we enter into this new season of what America and what church looks like, see yourself better and know that we have come so far.